All right, I've got past time to begin. Sorry about that. I'm first on the agenda this morning to give you a good Calvary Baptist welcome. So let me extend that welcome to you. We're so glad you've come to worship. If you're a guest with us and you've not yet done so, we'd love to have a record of your attendance with us. On the right-hand side of the bulletin, on the inside, there is a portion for you to fill out and place in the collection plate when it comes by so we can have that record of your attendance with us today. Helps us get to know you better. And so if you do that for us, we would deeply appreciate it. We've got some fun things planned this afternoon. We're going to have a back-to-school bash, and it starts at 3.30. Go, we'll go to about 5.30. There will be a lot of activities and fun out on the front lawn. And so we encourage you to come and bring your family and uh, bring uh, your lounge chairs and just fellowship together. Uh, there'll be some uh, free popcorn and water, I understand. But also there'll be a special uh, truck uh, that will have treats. That's the Sweet Seasons will be here. And you can uh, purchase sweets from them if you would like. But it's just a very informal time of fellowship and fun. So I hope you'll come join us this afternoon. The Lord's given us a little bit uh, cooler weather. And uh, looks like he's going to hold the rain off, and so we're going to have a good time this afternoon. Keep that in mind. Next Sunday, we're going to have a men's ministry breakfast. So we encourage all our men to come together next Sunday morning at 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall for breakfast. And then uh, please make note that uh, we have a, still a couple of mission opportunities going on. We now have, during August, our Shoes for Orphan Souls and you'll find some boxes around in the church for you to place pairs of new shoes uh, that you can give for this ministry. And also, uh, our backpack ministry continues. And uh, so if you'd like to be involved in that, we'll get you the information, get you a backpack for you to take home and fill up for that ministry. Uh, so a lot of things happening as we get started back to school, and uh, we're looking forward to a new church year starting in just a few weeks, September the 1st. And so these are exciting days. Join me in prayer as we begin today. Father, it's good to come together. I'm reminded of what the psalmist said. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. I'm so glad that you called us together. As the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I, my heart rejoices today just the opportunity to be with brothers and sisters in Christ and worship together. And I pray your Holy Spirit would move in this place. Touch our hearts, challenge us, convict us of sin, draw us close to you, challenge us in our ministry for you in these days. We love you. We exalt your name now. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning? We get our strength from the Lord as we lift Him up, as we worship Him, and as we hear from Him. He is the everlasting God, and so let's worship Him together. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. Defender of the weak, and 
so thankful that in this broken world our strength comes from you father uh, you lift us up father when we're down and we turn our face and our eyes upon you jesus christ the living lord you lift us up you lift our soul up you lift our spirits up you put our feet back on the right path that we might walk and have relationships like you want us to have leading others into the glory of the Lord, to know you, to know your righteousness. Father, you are an everlasting God, the everlasting God. And Father, we're so thankful to worship you today. Father, I pray that uh, as we do so, Father, you would put joy in our hearts. Father, you'd put a smile of victory upon our face. For we are not defeated as children of God. Father, we love you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all Above all kings 
is above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. You were the, you were here before the world Above all kingdoms, give you thanks above all thrones, above all wonders this world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of those lyrics that you just sang. Lord, you were crucified for me. You thought of me above all. Would you give him thanks as we prepare to sing this next song that says you're worthy of it all. He thought you worthy of it all that he gave his life. for a relationship with you. prepare to give him all the glory and praise. It says all the saints, that's all those who have believed and called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the saints and angels bow before your throne. 
morning with message number three out of five messages in a series from the book of Jude entitled Unmasking the Imposter. I'm drawing from Dr. O.S. Hawkins who wrote a book entitled Unmasking the Imposter and then it was later published under a different format uh, entitled In Sheep's Clothing. But he has done extensive study in the book of Jude. I have found his work very helpful. This morning I have entitled the message, The Danger of Apathy. The Danger of Apathy. And we're going to look at Jude, beginning there with verse 5. And I'll be reading through verse 7. 
Is mine not working today? Static. Static. <clears throat> but I want you to be, or I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not keep the proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as, exa as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Consider this morning the danger of apathy. I read about a third grader that wrote that wore a Fitbit to class. Now, do you know what a Fitbit is? Some of us might not know. It is a watch. It keeps up with a lot of things, but it will keep up with the steps that you make. And so most people wear a Fitbit to keep up with the steps that they take. The third grader wore a Fitbit to school. The teacher was prompted to ask her, are you keeping up with your steps? She said, no, I'm wearing this for my mommy so she can so show my daddy when he gets home. <laughs> Jude challenges us to wake up, to be alert, and to watch, lest we be deceived. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus tells a parable. It's called the parable of the sower. Jesus said a man went out to sow. The seed represents God's word. And Jesus said some seed fell on the wayside, which is hard ground. And Jesus said these are the ones who hear and receive God's word with enthusiasm but don't have roots. And when the time of testing comes and the pressure gathers, they fall away. And friend, that is the imposter. He hears God's word with his head, but not with his heart. He commits with his head, but not his heart. He is a hearer, but not a Doa, and when times of testing comes upon his life, he is exposed for what he is. Now let's look at verse 4 and let's just have a review. Because verse 4 here tells us several things about the imposter that Jude is warning us about. First, Jude tells us about their deceitfulness. He tells us that they creep in. The word picture that Jude uses there is of an alligator lying on the bank of the river. And he eases into the water so secretly and silently that he doesn't even make a ripple in the water. Likewise, the imposter secretly and silently creeps into our schools and into our denominations and into our churches. And once he's in the church, he creeps his way into small groups. He creeps his way into the choir, into the pew, and even into the pulpit. He is deceitful. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. They are deceitful. 
Also, Jude tells us in verse 4 about their devotion. He writes that they are ungodly men. Now, that means they do not respect God. They do not honor God. They do not reverence God. Titus 1.16 says, They claim to know God, but their actions deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good or godly. Jude tells us about their deceitfulness. He tells us about their devotion. But he also tells us about their demeanor. Notice he writes there in verse 4. They turn the grace of God into lewdness. That word lewdness means, uh, means an absence of moral restraint. It speaks of a person who does whatever they want to do without shame or guilt. They pervert the grace of God using it as a license to sin. They live by the assumption, I can do whatever I want. I'm living under grace. God will forgive me for it. That is called antinomanianism. Y'all didn't know I knew that big a word, did you? It's out of the Greek language. The anti means against. The nomos means law. They're anti-law. It describes a person who rejects the laws and argues against moral and social norms. Jude tells us about their demeanor. Folks, listen to me today. The grace of God is not a license to sin. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Folks, our liberty in Christ is not for us to do what we want. It's rather for us to do what we ought it is dangerous to insult the spirit of grace by using it as a license to sin. Finally, Jude tells us not only about the deceitfulness and the devotion and demeanor of the imposter, but he tells us about the doctrine. And if you'll notice there in verse 4, they deny only the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the worst, friend, of who they are. This is the root of the problem. The imposter denies that Jesus is Lord. Friends, let me just say to you today, there's only one Lord. His name is Jesus. He's the only one and the only way to eternal life. Did you know for about 250 years after the death of Paul, the Romans persecuted the Christians. They were crucified and burned and beheaded and fed to lions. Do you know why? Because genuine believers would not bend and they would not bow to an image of Caesar. They would not say... Caesar is Lord. In Rome, there's a building called the Pantheon. It's one of the best preserved ruins of the Romans. It was built in 27 B.C. And it was built to serve all the gods of the day. Around the inside of the Pantheon, you will find niches to the gods and goddesses of the people that the Romans conquered. It was their way to appease their captives. For example, there was a niche to the god Jupiter. His followers would come to the pantheon. They would go to the niche of Jupiter, and there they would worship him. There was a niche to other gods. There was one to Juno, to Apollo, to Venus, and on and on it went. And when the Romans conquered the Christians, they said, 
We will make a niche for Jesus. But the Christian said, no, there will be no niche for, the, for Jesus because he alone is Lord. And friend, they gave their lives for that truth. They died insisting that Jesus was the one and sovereign Lord God. And that's the central truth of our faith. And the imposters denied that central truth. So there in verse 4, as just a review, you see the imposter. We are reminded to beware, to be awakened to his deceitfulness. He creeps in unnoticed. To his devotion, he's ungodly. We are to be aware of his demeanor. He is immoral. He is without shame. And finally, we are to be aware of his doctrine. He denies that Jesus is Lord. You know what Jude is doing? He's sending you a warning. He's sending the church a warning. Watch. Do not be deceived. I read about a guy that walked into a store to get a bag of chips and some Cokes. And when he walked in the door, a lady came up to him looking sad. And she said, you remind me exactly of my son. But he's not with us anymore. Could you do me a favor and say, hi, mama, to me? It would make me feel so good. It seemed like a, a strange request. But he does it. And he does it kind of loud because she's hard to hear it. A couple of minutes later, he's on the next aisle. She walks up to him with tears in her eyes. And she said, or, or, or she says, I hate to keep bothering you, but it would mean so much if you'd just say, I love you, Mama. Now that seems even weirder to him, but he feels so sorry for her, so he says pretty loudly, I love you, Mama. He then goes to the back of the store to get his drinks. And he's coming back to the register and the woman has got her groceries and as she goes out, she says, you've been so good to me, but I want to ask one more favor of you. Would you say, bye, mama? And so he says it pretty loudly. Bye, mama. So she leaves and he gets up to the register, you know, and uh, she rings him up and she says, that'll be a total of $125. He says, for chips and drink? And the lady, the clerk says, your mama said you were buying her groceries today. <laughs> Friend, we'd better be careful. We will be deceived. And I want to tell you the days of deception are here and greater days of deception are coming. Now here's the great question of today. Y'all with me? How can a person who is deceitful, ungodly, immoral, and denies that Jesus is Lord, how can that person infiltrate the church and even gain a place of influence? How can that happen? Apathy. Apathy. Webster defines apathy as a lack of interest or indifference. Friend, schools, denominations, and churches are being torn apart by conflict, not only because imposters have crept in unnoticed, but because genuine Christians have not cared enough to stop them. Apathy is dangerous for you, it's dangerous for others, and it's dangerous for our society. Kitty Genoese was stabbed to death in suburb New York City 60 years ago. But her tragic death continues as a symbol of public apathy. In the early morning hours, she returned home from work. A man attacked her with a knife. 
And she screamed, oh, I've been stabbed. Oh, my God, I've been stabbed. Please help me. Please help me. Lights in apartments went on. The killer left momentarily. No others came to her aid. And when the lights went out again, the attacker came back and stabbed her again. And she shouted again, I've been stabbed. Help me, help me. No one came to her aid. Lights went out again. For the third time, he came back. This time, he delivered the fatal blow. During that 35-minute ordeal, 38 people watched or heard all or parts of the attack, and no one came to her aid. And after a little time elapsed, witnesses began to speak up and they said, we were afraid, I was tired, or we didn't want to get involved. Now folks, here's an often used quote. The only thing needed for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. James 4, 17 says, To him who knows to do good but does not do it, to him it is sin. Folks, apathy causes many problems in our country, in our culture, and in our churches today. I want you to know, apathy is dangerous. Now, we're going to look at our text for a moment. And what we find here are three illustrations from history that warn us about apathy. These illustrations reveal the danger of apathy. You see, apathy makes us losers. And these illustrations center around the Hebrews, the angels, and the pagans. Three points to the outline or in the outline today. First of all, when apathetic, we can lose our victory. The illustration is found right here in verse 5. Look at what it says. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward... Destroyed those who did not believe. Now here we find the illustration of the Hebrews. The experience that Jude is talking about took place at Kadesh Barnea where the people of God were poised to go into the promised land. You can find the details in Numbers 14. But Moses had led the people out of Egyptian bondage to the promised land. And he sent 12 spies into the land. And 10 spies, the majority, focused on the giants and the walled cities in the land. And they concluded that there was no way that they could conquer the promised land. Two spies... Joshua and Caleb, the minority, came back with a positive report believing it could be conquered because God had promised it. But the Hebrews decided to follow the majority and in judgment sent 40 years wandering in the wilderness for their unbelief. Now folks, it is hard for me to understand How in just a brief time, the Hebrews no longer believed the same God who parted the sea, destroyed Pharaoh's army, provided food and water every day, led them by a pillar of cloud every day and a pillar of fire at night. It is hard for me to believe that they did not believe the same God would enable them to conquer the land. How can that happen? How can they have such tragic unbelief? The answer is apathy. Apathy. 
apathetic unbelief. And did you know it's the same with us today? There are some of us here today, we're very concerned about our future. Matter of fact, we're worried about our future. We fail to trust God who's been faithful to us in the past about our future. Friend, I want to tell you the same God who took care of you in the past is going to take care of you in the future. But when we don't remember, when we do not remember, we fall and we lose our victory. Only those who were 20 years of age or less and Joshua and Caleb lived to enter the promised land, the rest of them missed their victory because of apathetic unbelief. When the great conqueror Napoleon and his armies crossed the Alps, they came into a battle with their enemy his troops found themselves surrounded there in a valley and many of them began to die. And the great leader's heart went out to his men. And so in desperation, he turned to the bugler boy and said, sound retreat. And the bugler boy did nothing. And so Napoleon turned to him and said, play retreat or many more of our men are going to die. And the boy said, I've forgotten what retreat sounds like. I've forgotten what it is. And finally Napoleon shouted, well, play something. And so he, play, he played charge. And Napoleon's troops thought that help was coming, so they fought with all their might. And the enemy thought, we've got to retreat because they are being reinforced. And thus Napoleon won the battle and even the war because a bugler boy had forgotten how to sound retreat. You listen to me, dear friend. Retreating on God or quitting on God is no option. Going back to Egypt is no option. Wandering in the wilderness is no option. A genuine Christian never quits on God through apathetic unbelief. When we do, we will lose our victory. Number two, when apathetic, we can lose our vocation. Look at verse 6. Here Jude uses the illustration of angels. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Not a great day, but the great day. Hey, listen. In apathy, these angels lost their vocation. They lost their call. They lost their purpose. G writes... They did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. I like how the NIV version uses or translates, some of the angels didn't stay where they belonged. And they didn't keep their positions of authority. Some of the angels left their lofty positions and their purpose in the heavens in apathetic rebellion and they lost their vocation say preacher what in the world happened well according to God's word there was, a, there was an angelic group who followed Lucifer in a rebellion against God and Isaiah 14 in Ezekiel chapter 28 gives us a glimpse into that rebellion but Lucifer, who will become or would become Satan, said, I will be as the Most High. And Lucifer and his angelic followers pridefully attempted to overthrow the throne of God. But they were defeated and they were cast out of heaven. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from the heaven like lightning. Those angels now are called fallen angels. 
Now some of those, along with Lucifer, who is Satan, they're upon the earth right now. The angelic fallen angels are called demons. They do see Satan's bidding. You see, Satan's not like God. He can't be present everywhere at once. And so he's got a host who do his bidding. But did you know there were many of those fallen angels who were judged and they were locked away in chains and in darkness? Look at the second part of verse 6. You see it right there. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. 2 Peter 2.4 adds, God did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Preacher, why did these angels give up their position? Why did they give up their purpose? Why did they give up their vocation? Because they were too apathetic to guard themselves from temptation and evil. And did you know that can happen to you? And that can happen to me. We can be so apathetic that we refuse to watch and pray and guard ourselves against temptation and evil. And before we know it, we've lost our vocation as servants of God. Back in 2006, Ted Haggard, founder and pastor of the 14,000 member New Life Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado, resigned in the midst of a sexual illegal drug scandal. The father of five was listed in Time magazine in 2005 as one of the top 25 most influential evangelicals in America. But he finally admitted to a homosexual affair and using crystal meth. Ted Haggard grew apathetic. He did not guard himself. And so he lost his position. He lost his vocation as a minister and a servant of God. And recently, we have read of, of alleged indiscretions in mega church or among mega church ministers like T.D. Jakes, Robert Morris, and Tony Evans. They've stepped away from their ministries. They stepped away from their, from their vocation because of alleged indiscretion. Why? They did not watch. They did not guard. Apathy caused them to lose their vocation. Now you hear me, Christian? Every Christian, every genuine Christian has a spiritual vocation or calling. You watch it. You pray for it. You guard it lest you lose that spiritual vocation. Now there's a third point. When apathetic, we can lose our victory. When apathetic, we can lose our vocation. But thirdly, when apathetic, we can lose our virtue. Our virtue. There in verse 7 is where we find this, my friend. And this is the illustration of the pagans in Sodom and Gomorrah. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. Listen to the NIV version. Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of everlasting fire. Do you see the phrase strange flesh? It refers to homosexual lust. Did you know Sodom and Gomorrah were at one time blessed cities? They were blessed and privileged places. 
They were situated in a blessed area. It was well watered. And it was like the garden of the Lord, according to Genesis chapter 13, verse 10. They were prosperous. Ezekiel chapter 16, 49 tells us they had the fullness of food and the abundance of idleness. Folks, you don't have your belly full and nothing to do without being blessed. Without being materially blessed. At one time, Sodom and Gomorrah was well blessed. But apathy caused them to lose their virtue, lose their morals, lose their principles. They became tolerant. It is said that what one generation tolerates, the next generation embraces. Oh, how we see that in America today. Finally, sin, depravity was so rampant, they no longer cared. And did you notice, Jude tells us, that that depravity began to spread to the other cities surrounding them. There's an interesting phrase there. It's translated sexual immorality. One translation uses the word gross immorality. But it comes from the from the Greek word ek, porneo. Ek meaning out of, and porneo meaning sexual sin or sexual perversion. It is from that word that we get our English word pornography. It's only used one time in the New Testament, right here, and it means utterly unchaste. It pictures incredible sexual Deviance and perversion. Gross immorality. Sounds like America today to me. Sin, and in particular sexual sin, is rampant to the point in America where we have grown apathetic to it. We no longer point it out. And we no longer stand against it. In judgment, those who were guilty experienced not just the fire and brimstone that God sent upon the cities, but I want to tell you they also experienced the judgment of eternal fire. Listen, friends. We may lose a lot. But if we still have our virtue, we can still walk with our heads held high. But we've got to fight to keep our virtue. Did you know apathy is a great enemy to morality? Apathy causes us to compromise. And apathy makes us tolerant of sin. And many Christians want to play around in Satan's playground and still love Jesus. Friends, listen. As Christians, we've got to do what the hymn says so well. We've got to stand up and stand up for Jesus. We've got to do everything we can to keep our virtue. It's time to close. A story is told of a high school teacher who taught her high school or who taught long enough in high school to know he didn't belong there. He was assigned to teach a course filled with students who didn't want to learn. I mean, it was one of those classes where students had to get there early just to get a back row seat. On occasion, of course, you know, those who didn't care at all were seated there on the front row. I mean, they could care less what subject it was. There was a high school teacher finally got so fed up with their apathy. He grabbed a marker. He turned around to the marker board. And with his marker, he made the letters about one foot high. A dash, P dash, A dash, T dash, H dash, Y. And then he made the 
the uh, mark for the exclamation point, and when he went to put the period on it, he broke the marker. And there was a student on the front row who looked at it and looked at it. Finally, he tilted his head this way. And he just started sounding it. A, pay, thee. A, pay, thee. A, pay, thee. He turned to his friend. What does that mean? He said, who knows and who cares? Y'all do know the meaning of apathy, right? Who knows? And who cares? Such was the attitude that Jude is warning us about. Folks, we are in our present condition in our schools and in our nation and in our churches because of apathy. Because good people don't care enough to do anything about it. You got it? We're in our present condition because people no longer care. And it seems like the church has given up the fight. Friends, I want to tell you, we've got to come to the place where we again pray and seek zeal, and seek passion, and stand up before we lose our victory, and before we lose our vocation, and before we lose our virtue. The wise man Solomon, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, said there are seven deadly sins. Wrath, Greed, sloth, pride, lust, envy, and gluttony. Did you know the word sloth has been often translated apathy? Apathy comes like other sin in our lives because we are playing in the devil's playground. I want to warn you today. Apathy is one of the seven deadly sins. Wake up. Wake up! Watch out! Guard yourself! Pray, pray, pray that God will give you zeal and give you passion to make a stand for Jesus in these dark days. It's the only thing, friend, that will make a difference. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth. I pray your Holy Spirit will now lead and guide and show us what we need to see today. Father, there are many of us in this place today that have grown apathetic. We no longer see what we need to see. We no longer stand against what we need to stand against. We've grown so used to sin around us and the condition of our schools and churches and and country that we no longer care. I pray, Father, today for a spiritual awakening in this place. Forgive us for our apathy. For we know it is sin. And I pray today that we would renew our lives to you, to your cause. Help us to be awakened and to guard against apathy in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, let me extend the invitation. I'm going to move here to the front. If you're not a Christian, we invite you to come give your life to Jesus. He loves you. He died for you. He wants to live inside your heart. He wants to live in you and work through you. If you will invite him into your life and trust in him, he will give you eternal life. 
you'll come to me during the invitation. I'll tell you what to do. If you want to come and join the church from another church, please come. You obey the Spirit of God and come. Finally, the altar is open for you. Come and pray. Be honest with yourself today. Let the Spirit of God convict you and lead you today. We got to overcome apathy, friend. It is dangerous. It is dangerous. And we've got to overcome it through the power of Jesus. And I'm praying that the Lord will touch our hearts today concerning apathy. You just let the Spirit of God lead you. He may lead you to this altar to pray. He may lead you to pray right where you are. But you respond as he touches your heart. Let's stand together. Let's sing and you come. And you 